Look, we get it. Being a Philadelphia sports fan on Saturday was pretty tough. First, the Union lost the MLS Cup, and the Phillies proceeded to break our hearts for a second time by losing Game 6 of the World Series. But we are not going to be dwelling on their losses today. Both these teams have terrific seasons, and we want to celebrate how well they both did. So on this episode, we'll be recapping the terrific seasons of both the Philadelphia Union and the Philadelphia Phillies here on this episode of Sports Talk Philadelphia. Welcome back to Sports Talk Philadelphia. As always, I'm your host, Aiden Tuzinski, and I'm joined by a very melancholy panel today. How are we feeling, Shane? Uh, I'm feeling a little upset, but, you know, I'll get through it. Mike, how are you doing today? Yeah, I mean, whenever you're going through not one but two championship losses, it, it's tough, but we'll, we'll get through it like we always do. Yeah, we will get through it. Like I said, this is, this is a happy episode. This is not going to be a sad one because, like I said in the intro, both these teams had terrific seasons. We're going to start with the Phillies, who, following last season's disappointment, had a very great offseason. After the lockout, they signed two key pieces to the roster, adding Kyle Schwarber with a four-year, $79 million contract, and Nick Cassianos with a five-year, $100 million contract. They also added a lot of depth to their bullpen, adding Brad Hannum, Reyes Familia on one-year contracts. It definitely was a lot of added pieces to the Phillies that made fans very excited for the season. And after the lockout, we weren't even sure if baseball was going to happen this year. So the fact we did was amazing. The fact that the Phillies added these pieces were also great. Guys, how were you feeling at the beginning of this season? Uh, well, this, I mean, after the signing of Cassianos and Schroeber, I mean, I think just like every other Phillies fan, like, we felt great. Like, I mean, um, we are caught, like, they had a sign out since Bank Park before the season saying, ball go boom, because we all thought, like, they were going to hit all these home runs because of signing Kyle Schroeber and Cassianos, which Kyle Schroeber did his part for that. I mean, they signed him essentially to hit home runs, which he did with 46 home runs, and he had the... He had an incredible June like he did last season with the uh, Washington Nationals, but the Nick Cassiano signing was a little disappointed this year. Yeah, um, I love the Fanatic, but I'm going to put him down right here on the desk. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, Cassianos was coming off, I think he was an MVP candidate last year, uh, 34 home runs, 100 RBIs, and he batted 3 or 9. I mean, he was the Reds' offense, and he, he carried that team, but, you know, he – Obviously, it was a little disappointing for the Phils this year. Um, but like, like you said, Shane, Schwarber did his job, 46 home runs. You know, that's, that's what you want from him and probably a little even more. Um, and he gave you that pop at the leadoff spot, and that's, that's what the Phillies needed. Yeah, no, there was also a couple of early games where both those guys hit home runs. It really got the fans energized. It seemed like the Phillies were off for a great run. And then a couple more games happened, and things looked a lot bleaker after those first five games. The worst part of the entire season, the biggest downfall, had to be April 29th when the Phillies got no hit by the Mets, 3-0. It just felt like that the whole season was tanking. Um, in the beginning of June, their record was 22-29 on June 3rd. That was the date that Joe Girardi got fired after two seasons. It was the third season for him. And it just seemed like that the whole season was going downhill. The Phillies decided to name Rob Thompson as the interim manager for the Phillies. It seemed like a very interesting choice at the time. Thompson had been a baseball lifer with the Yankees for most of his career, was added to the Phillies as a bench coach when Joe Girardi was hired. It seemed as though it, the Phillies were giving up at that point. Would you guys agree? Yeah, because, I mean, Joe Girardi, the way he managed, he wouldn't play the young guys. Like, he wouldn't play Bryson Stott. He, uh, he would platoon Alec Bohm and... Um, I mean, it's just, and the, he managed the bullpen horrible. I mean, he Jerry's familiar with one of their signings. I mean, he'd always bring him in tough situations, and he wouldn't be able to get the job done. So, uh, essentially, hiring Rob Thompson fixed that because Rob Thompson, he played, he consistently played Bry Bryson Stott more at shortstop, which helped Bryson Stott. And I mean, he went on to have a good season. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything you said there. I mean, if they waited, maybe even like a week or even a couple of days after they might not have made the playoffs just because they barely snuck into the playoffs. So I, that was, I think that was a great move that they got rid of Girardi when they did. Um, but yeah, like everything you said, he, he just, 
the lineup, he just he switched around too much. Uh, he he didn't like Kyle Schwarber leading off. So if it wasn't for Thompson, you know, we wouldn't even have Schwarber leading off for the rest of the year. Um, but yeah, and just like you said, he managed the bullpen horribly. Familia was he acted like he was familiar from 2016. He wasn't, and he just it, it was just every year. And like you said, he wasn't giving the guys like Stott and Bowman a chance, and they need to play, and they did play, and it paid off for the Phillies in the end of the year. Yeah, so you guys both touched on the fact that Girardi didn't play the Rockies. That was a huge criticism. There was a lot of guys that played a lot better, like you mentioned, as the season went on after Thompson became the manager. Which player do you think benefited the most of having Thompson as their manager? Uh, I think it would be Bryson. I mean, I think it would be both Bryson Stott and Alec Bohm. I mean, we had you had Alec Bohm who had that one game against the Mets, uh, who had three errors in that game, and I mean the fans were booing him. He said, "I hate this place." And then after that game, like he turned it around after that. And then uh, Bryson Stott, like young players need to play every day. Uh, at the beginning of the season, Bryson Stott was playing very well. He was actually hitting the ball, and then he kept get he kept getting sat for Johan Camargo uh, when Jardy was. Um, the manager, and then when they hired Rob Thompson, Rob Thompson let these players just be who they wanted to be out on the field, and he's he's a player's manager, so that essentially helps with younger players. Yeah, I mean that's the biggest difference between him and Girardi and Thompson. I mean, it just seems like Thompson reaches to the younger players more, and they kind of respond to him better. You know, I'm not saying I mean Girardi won a championship, you know, and he's been to multiple ALCSs, so I'm not this discrediting him at all, but it just seemed like right when Thompson took over, it just kind of something flipped, and the team just looked like they actually wanted to play for him, and it just did not look like that the first month and a half of the season. And yeah, I agree. It's probably Boom or Stott, probably both of them equal. I mean, they both needed to play, and they got the experience, and now they got postseason experience, too, to boot. So I think that's going to go a long way in the long run. Yeah, the other piece that goes along with Stott is that he was behind Gene Segura at shortstop, and it seemed like Gene was going to be the main guy on the interior infield for the entire season. The other guy that was ahead of him was Didi Gregorius, who was very much struggling, but was also on the Yankees when Girardi was a manager for them. Girardi helped bring Didi over from the Yankees to the Phillies. Is there any chance that there was maybe some favoritism going on, and that's why Girardi was playing Didi over Stott? I think there was. I mean, like you said, uh, Didi Gregorius played for Joe Girardi under the Yankees. And um, usually when you have a player who played for you for a while, some coaches favoritize that player. I mean, it, like Didi Gregorius, I mean, he wasn't having a great season as well. He had a great 2020 season for us, and maybe that had something to do with it um, because he did have to deal with injuries and stuff, and he had COVID, um, which I feel like kind of derailed his season last year, and then it, that just didn't work out uh, this year. Uh, season for him and I mean Joe Girardi played Didi Gregorius more over Bryson Stott so um, I, I feel like yeah I had to do a favoritism at times. Yeah I mean I feel like you know I feel like Girardi he kind of had the mindset when he came like you know did, we have a veteran team we're ready to win and you know it, playing like Didi and guys like that but obviously that didn't seem to work out and Obviously, when he left, it, it worked out better that the young guys played better than the veterans that he thought would, you know, perform for him, but they didn't. And it's just, it's funny how when he left, that's when Boom and Stott, you know, finally started to come on their own. So I think there is a correlation there for sure. Yeah, the team definitely played so much better in the second half of the season than the first. There were still a lot of people that were not betting on the Phillies to be good. There's three key takes that were made that definitely stuck out to me. The first one was made by Ken Rosenthal. Um, this was right after Thompson was hired, after the Girardi firing. He said that after the Joe Girardi firing, it won't change a lot for the Phillies. The second take was made by Mets announcer Keith Hernandez, who also played for the Mets. So this might add a little bit of context to why he said this. But he basically said as an announcer, he doesn't like watching the Phillies and says, as for their fundamentals defensively, the Phillies have always just been, you know, not up to it. He did apologize, by the way, when the Phillies made it to the playoffs and were played a lot better later in the season. So maybe we can forgive him a little bit. And then the last one made by Jonathan Papelbon, the Phillies' all-time leader in saves, unfortunately, said that the Phillies will never win again. The Phillies will never get back to the playoffs. He also added some very colorful language, to say the least, while making these statements on the podcast and also said Bryce Harper was not a leader for the team. I doubt that has anything to do with the fact that him and Harper got into a fight when they were both teammates on the Nationals, but I digress. Anyway, out of these three terrible takes as they ended up being, which one do you guys think was the worst? 
Um, I think it was probably a Jonathan Papelbon one. I mean, I feel like he was just probably more upset over the fact that when he played for us, I mean, we were a bad team. It was rebuilding years. Um, and I kind of have to disagree with you on the Bryce Harper thing because I feel like they did have to do – I mean, when he uh, – when they both played on Washington, um, there was a time when Bryce Harper didn't run first base. And when he got back to the dugout, Jonathan Papelbon was mad about it and essentially went up to him and kind of choked him in the dugout. Um, almost killed him, basically. Um, and I feel like that had to do with him saying Bryce Harper isn't a leader. And But also, I feel like I had to do at the time, Bryce Harper was younger too. So he was essentially coming up as this big superstar and he had all this pressure on him. But as he got older, he got more mature. And also, just to add one more thing on the Kevin Rose's whole thing, I kind of agreed with that when it first happened. I feel like every Phillies fan did, in a sense, because it was still essentially the same team when Joe Girardi got fired, so it just didn't feel like they would pick it up and make the playoffs. Yeah, piggybacking on the Papabon point, um, you know, like you said with Harper, like he, he, had, he is a totally different player. He's definitely matured, and I think Papabon, I saw the comments about bad about Harper. I think he did kind of make some comments later uh, in the playoffs that he has matured and I think that's just credit to Harper. I mean he just as a player like like you said that fight it, it was not a, it did not look good for him um, but I mean I think everybody knows Papelbon especially here he's not the best teammate either so but so his words are eh but like like you said Rosen saw I, th I think a lot of people didn't think Girardi firing Girardi would get them to the World Series, at least. I, th I think that's fair. And then Keith Hernandez, you know, former Met, poking, poking some fun at the Phillies. But obviously, I think just Philly in general, I think they play better when they get criticism, kind of just using that as, you know, steam, as the underdog mentality. Yeah, I will also point out that Ken Roosevelt also did apologize in the playoffs. He made a really awesome video highlighting about how he was wrong, how the team played better. But Mike, going back to your point, you mentioned the fact that Keith Hernandez poked the bear. I felt like a lot of teams, players, Panelists, analysts, we're poking the bear with the Phillies. Do you guys think that that motivated the team to play better down the stretch? I feel like it did. I mean, even just going into the playoffs, like no one gave them a chance against the Braves at all. And I feel like that just kind of motivated them. Like, hey, we're here. After they clinched the playoffs in Houston on the uh, third to last game of the season, um, I feel like that just took like everything, all the weight off their back. And they're like, hey, we made it, like we made it, let's see what we can do here. And then when they got into the wild card spot, I think that first game in the ninth inning, uh, when they came back being down two nothing, I really think that fueled them into being able to think that they can beat the Braves in the division series. Yeah, it almost seems like the baseball guys kind of like heard that from Keith Hernandez and then turned Nick Cassianos into like a gold glover for the, for the playoffs, even though maybe it's sacrificed taking his bat away. But yeah, I mean, I think, just like any, when you hear criticism, I think it's always how you respond to it. And the Phillies, they did that all year, all year long. When they got down, they responded. And I mean, that's what they have to take into next season too. All the people saying, "Oh, you know, they got destroyed with the Astros. They shouldn't have been there." Take that next year, and you know, put that to the Phillies over the top and learn from what they did in this Astros series. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. Also, to wrap up this point, Shane, you mentioned the fact that Harper has turned into a much better leader. Um, on the Phillies than he was with the Nationals. Definitely maturity played a factor. I also think there's 330 million reasons why Bryce Harper should be a better leader at this point in his career. Um, but anyway, after all these comments were made, after all this, the trade deadline happened around the same time, and the Phillies, for the first time in a very long time, were spenders rather than buyers. And the biggest thing, or they were buyers rather than sellers. And the couple key pieces they got were from the Angels, coincidentally. They got Noah Syndergaard trading, um, Bright, or sorry, Mickey Moniak, who was their first overall pick in 2016. They then also got Brandon Marsh in a separate trade to replace Moniak at center field. They also traded in Jojo Romero for Amanda Sosa. That seemed like a very low key trade at the time. It didn't seem that important. Once the playoffs came around, that was a really big trade. And the final thing that happened at the deadline that didn't also seem like it would impact the Phillies that much, but did, was the fact that the Brewers traded Josh Hader for two MLB players and two prospects. That trade was the only thing the Brewers would make. It felt like that if the Brewers had done more, they would have been in a much better position to make the playoffs. Instead, they traded their best closer. Guys, how did you feel at the trade deadline after all that stuff happened? I felt like, I mean, I felt like it definitely helped the Phillies a little bit because they got their, they got their fourth, fifth starter that they needed because, you know, they had Eflin who was hurt and they essentially were using Bally Falter. But he, I mean, even though Syndergaard would go five innings, uh, Bailey Falter would also, and then um, the Brandon Marsh, I mean, with Odubel Herrera out in center field, I mean, they needed to fix that 
really bad, and that helped because Brandon Marsh is a great defender out there in center field. And, I mean, he makes plays that are hard plays look very easy. And the easy play is obviously easy that Adubel Herrera wasn't making out there in center field. So I feel like the trade deadline definitely helped them. And one more thing was the David Robertson when they made the David Robertson trade as well. Um, I feel like that kind of shored up the bullpen a little bit. Yeah, I mean, they didn't make any moves like the Padres did with, like, Soto or Hayter. But at the same time, they, when it happened, I liked the moves. I mean, you had to add another center fielder. You added some pitching. And they did it without giving up your two top prospects in Andrew Painter and Mick Abel. So I think that was huge. Um, you know, they didn't need to go and fix everything, but they did need to add stuff. And just like now for next season, they got to look at what they need and just add on to it. Yes, yeah, so the Phillies definitely added the pieces they felt like they needed to make the playoffs. And they were able to get in, although September was pretty hairy for a little bit. They had a losing record. It seemed like that they weren't going to make the playoffs. And then October happened. And this was just a run that nobody saw coming. First, they beat the Astros on a Monday, three days before the, se the season ended, sorry. And then they go on to face the Cardinals in the first wild card round ever in Major League Baseball history. They go down in the first game 2 nothing. end up coming back to win 6-2. to two. They then proceed to win the second game, go 2 nothing to win the series. They play the Braves, who was a team that they were pretty much even with all season long in the NL East, although the Braves were much better than them record-wise. They go on to beat the Braves, beat the Padres in a series that nobody saw coming, especially after the Padres beat the Dodgers, and then face the Astros in the World Series. Unfortunately, as we all know, they did not win that series, falling a couple games short of winning just their third World Series in uh, franchise history. But guys, this run was just amazing. Do you have a favorite part about this run? I think it was back in the Cardinals series after Boom got hit in the elbow. I mean, he got hit. It was the bases loaded, and he got hit in the elbow. And after um, he got hit, you seen him start to clap, like and look in the dugout, like, "All right, guys, let's go, let's go." And then Gene Segura comes up and uh, hits a little dribble uh, down um, the right field line and into right field, and it got under the second baseman. And that just fueled them right there. So that was probably my favorite part of the playoffs. Yeah, for me, it's definitely that play we're seeing right now, the, the Harper play. Um, and I was there too, so maybe I'm a little biased. To that it's just it was great seeing that. But you know, at the, I think I do like that the moment that you said. But I think just we did not expect them to get here at all, and just they definitely made it worth waiting 11 years because we just winning the one playoff series. I was like, okay, you know, we won one, we'll be back next year. But when they kept winning, you're like, all right, they can actually do something. And it was fun to watch. And hopefully this is not just a one year thing. And I don't think it is, but we'll see how they take this and their experience and put it next year. Yeah, it definitely feels like that there's two similar playoff teams in Philly's history that this can be compared to. One was the 93 team, which came out of nowhere to make it to the World Series. Similar to the Phillies get also lost in six games. That was to the Blue Jays on a Joe Carter home run that felt eerily similar almost to Alvarez's, although Carter's was in the ninth inning, Alvarez's was in the sixth. Or it could be compared to the 2006, or 2008 team, sorry, that would win the World Series, would have a great run. Which one do you think that this team's going to be? Yeah, I think they're better than the 93 team. Um, obviously, we weren't born then, but just like here, I, just on paper, they were definitely better than them. I think if you're going to compare it, probably the 08 09 team, and maybe it's just a flip-flop. Maybe this is our 09, and the next year will be our 08, where we lose one and then we win one. So I think it is, because I think it depends what they do this season, too. If they had guys like Turner or and just turn this team into a juggernaut, yeah, I think you might even be talking about the 2011 team when they won 100 win teams. Obviously, they didn't win the World Series, but I think it is more the 2008-09 team rather than 93. Yeah, I have to agree. I think it is more resembles 2018 because – um, I mean, even though they didn't win the World Series, but in 2008, you had in the Division Series, um, uh, Victor Uno hit that Grand Slam off of CeCe Zabathia, and when that happened, like, everyone just thought, like, wow, like, this is our year. We really think we're going to win this. And then you also had the moment in the NLCS in 2008 when Matt Stairs hit the home run. Um, and I feel like that moment happened with Bryce Harper in the championship series against the Padres when he hit that uh, two-run home run in the eighth inning. And, I mean, you just had so many moments that kind of resembled the 2008 team, even though uh, the 2022 team didn't win the World Series. I know it was definitely so many great moments that we will just remember for the rest of our lives. Hopefully this isn't like what happened in the last 11 years where this is the only thing that we can cheer about playoff wise hopefully they keep making it back but still just an awesome run my Phillies I know they fell short but I'm so glad that we get to talk about the season that they had 
I'm also excited about, to talk about the next team that we're going to and the run that they had this season in the Philadelphia Union. This was a team that last year had one of the most heart-crushing losses that you could possibly have. After being the one seed throughout the entire Eastern Conference in 2021, they made it to the Eastern Conference Finals where they had to play NYCFC. It felt like an easy slam dunk win for them. And then 11 players got COVID, six were starters, they ended up losing that game. Guys, I know that you might not be the biggest soccer fans, but anyone can talk about the fact that after having a loss like that, you can use that as motivation going into your season. How do you think the union felt after that loss? I feel like they felt devastated. I mean, after last season because of um, the, you know, they had, you said they had six players or they had 11 players out with COVID and six were starters, and they lost in the championship uh, series. But then this year they come back and they make it into – the cup finals and I feel like that's just big motivation for any team in general in any sport uh, for next season. Yeah I mean I'm not a big soccer guy at all I'll be honest but at the same time just watching that game there's no way you don't get deflated. I mean they were up they were up by a goal in extra time I forget what minute it was but I think it was the latest scoring goal in MOS Cup history. Um, but yeah that's deflating and when you lose in penalty shootouts which I don't think I think they should I'm not very sure in all soccer rules, but I think they should do what hockey does, like a golden golden goal type thing. I don't think it should end on a shootout, but that's deflating, especially uh, the goaltender, LaSalle alum, which is more deflating. Yeah. But, you know, it sucks, but hopefully they can take this and just bounce back next year. Yeah, so, I mean, just the season they had as well, so many great moments. Um, obviously, the championship was the most deflating, but look at what they did this season. 15 shutouts, six games with four or more goals, including three games where they scored six or more goals, which is also an MLS record. And, which, yeah, it was just an awesome season overall. Going back to that playoff game, yes, the championship was disappointing, but also the playoff run, beating FC Cincinnati in a very physical game, getting their revenge against NYC FC, uh, which was a 3-1 to one final in the Eastern Conference Finals, and then the penalty shootout, like we talked about. Uh, shout out, I guess, to Joe McCarthy, who was a LaSalle alum, who from Philadelphia, who ended up beating the Philadelphia team, which just felt like a very weird theme this season of former Philly natives beating the Philadelphia teams, which I don't really love. But it's awesome to see guys from this area that are playing that well to get to that level. So it is cool to see from that perspective. Um, I'm just really glad that the Union were able to get to where they were. We're now going to go to Fast Five. We have a very special Fast Five as well. This is an episode that is recapping everything. We're going to come up with our own uh, Sports Talk Philadelphia awards for these two teams. So the first award that we're giving out is called the Ryan Howard Award. This award goes out to the best power hitter. doesn't have to be the best, best overall player for the Phillies, but just a guy that consistently, when you knew was going up to the plate, was going to hit home runs, was maybe not always the best guy to have in on-base situations, although they might get a lot of walks. The batting average might not be great as well, which definitely goes with this guy. Kyle Schwarber, you have won the Sports Talk Philadelphia 2022 Ryan Howard Award for what you did hitting the ball out of the ballpark, 46 home runs, 94 RBIs, and a very, let's say, putrid 218 batting average. Guys, what do you think about Kyle Schwarber's year this year? I think he had a good year for what they signed him for. Like we said earlier in the show, they signed him with two hit home runs, which he did. He had 46 home runs, and he also had 94 RBIs. And he didn't really have a bad on-base percentage. I mean, it was 323, so he did essentially walk a couple times. So, I mean, he did his job to watch and we haven't really got to see a power hitter like that since Howard I mean we kind of saw when Hoskins first came up he was just hitting home runs every at bat but yeah it was fun to watch you know but that average can definitely come up you know even even look at like Howard's stats when he was putting up 40 home runs every year he still was batting at least 240-50 so I'm, I kind of want to see that average get up a little bit I'm not th I'm not expecting him to be a 300 hitter at all but maybe just bring that up a little bit but yeah we bring him in for home runs that's what he did and that's what you, all you can hope for. Yeah, it sort of felt like he was your stereotypical power hitter where he either struck out, walked, or hit a home run. So you really can't complain if that's what he paid him to do. Uh, the next award goes is called the Steve Carlton Award. It goes to the Phillies' best starting pitcher. Steve Carlton is obviously the best Phillies starting pitcher in history. Sorry, Robin Roberts. I can't really argue with that. But the award this year, the 2022 Sports Talk Philadelphia uh, Steve Carlton Award winner goes to Zach Wheeler, who was phenomenal this year, 12-7 and seven in the regular season, 282 ERA, 2.82 ERA, but just an unbelievable playoff run up until the World Series where it felt like that 
Maybe had he not been pulled, the Phillies would have won. It's hard to argue, but the fact is, is that he had an awesome season. Guys, what did you think about Zach Wheeler's year? Yeah, let's not forget, he did not have a spring training at all. So he, to start the season, when uh, he came back to, uh, I think in May or June or whatever it was, um, he – you see, like you see him, like he was struggling a little bit, and then as he got comfortable throughout the season, he started to look like Zach Wheeler of last season, and I think he just he uh, overall had a great season, and his fa- I think he has one of the best fastballs in the league, and uh, when he came back after not having spring training, like his fastball just wasn't there, and then essentially as the season kept going, he got better with the fastball. Yeah, I mean, he uh, he gave it it all. I mean, you see, he his arm probably was not even close to 100% in the playoffs coming off that injury, but he still was firing 100 miles per hour with that fastball. Like you said, I think he does have probably one of the best fastballs in the league. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think he deserve, he obviously deserves this. I mean, you know, you got Nola, but I think just Wheeler, what he did, and he, he kind of did put the, he put the team on his back, especially in the first two series against the Cardinals and Braves, so. Yeah, our final Phillies award is called the Mike Schmidt Award. It goes to the best player of the season. This would have been a regular season award. This guy would not have won it if the Phillies hadn't made it to the postseason, but he stepped up big time. Your Mike Schmidt Award winner from Sportstock Philadelphia for 2022 is Bryce Harper, mostly for what he did in the playoffs. He had six home runs, 13 RBIs. He had like 26 home runs overall, 76 uh, if you include the postseason with these stats. Guys, Bryce Harper just absolutely was monumental for that playoff run. Yeah, he was the first player in MLB history with 20 plus six, six plus home runs, six plus doubles in a single postseason. And he also had a 349 batting average, 414 OBP, 746 slugging, and he had a 1.160. And so we're now going to go to the Union Awards. Our first guy is going, the first award is called the Landon Donovan Award. The Union are just too new of a franchise, and all of their best players are playing right now to name any awards after Union players. But we're going to go with guys that are the best players in MLS history. The Landon Donovan Award winner will go to easily Daniel Gazdak. He was unbelievable this year. 22 goals, 10 assists. Should have been at least nominated for the MLS MVP. I don't know what, who makes the awards for them, but they really got to figure their stuff out. Um, and then the Nicky, Nick Romando winner, who was one of the best goalkeepers in MLS history, that award is going to, obviously, Andre Blake. 15 shutouts this season, 100 saves, easily the best goalkeeper in the MLS, which he won the award for. Guys, when you have key pieces like that, it's pretty easy to win uh, any type of championship or at least make it to championships. Yeah, I mean, essentially, like with the Phillies or Bryce Harper, yeah, they, they were that type of player, so... Yeah, and well, that wraps it up for this episode, very special episode of Sports Talk Philadelphia. Make sure to check us out on Twitter and Instagram at Sports Talk LTV. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we're also, again, awesome season for both the Philadelphia Union and Philadelphia Phillies. We're so happy we got to do this episode. Hopefully, you could do another one of these again in February. Thank you so much for watching, and make sure to tune in next time.